Take your Bible and uh, turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Last week, we went into some pretty heavy stuff on uh, who Melchizedek was. And uh, this week, I'm gonna, we're going to cut back down to a subject that is a little bit lighter in meat, but it seems to be a little bit harder for Christians to hear taught or accept or want to hear about it. And it's because it hits one of their loves. We're going to talk about the tithe this morning. We're going to talk about tithe this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll take and uh, bless the service this morning. I pray that you will take and um, teach us some things from your word, show us some things from your word. I pray that you'll take and uh, help us uh, as we try to understand it. I pray that you'll take and increase our faith in what you say. I pray that you'll bless everything that's said and done here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Alright. Move that out of the way. Let's pick up with verse uh, 4. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is now counted from them received tithes of Abraham. And blessed, and blessed him that had the promises. And without contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Alright. Here we have a, a whole lot of things about the tithe that many will overlook when they're uh, teaching the Bible. Now here's your standard Bible believer's position on the tithe, which has a lot of truth to it. The tithe is emphasized under the law. Now look at it. Verse... uh, It says uh, there in verse 5, says, uh, And verily they that are the sons of Levi who received the office of priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to what? According to the law. Okay? So the tithes under the law. Amen? Tithes part of the law. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to look at some tithe that's outside the law, but let's look at the tithe inside the law first. Okay? Alright. So, take your Bible and turn to um, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. Now let's see the rules of the tithe under the law. Leviticus chapter 27, Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Alright, so what is tithe? Everything in the land. The fruit of the land. Matter of fact, there's, a, there's another passage that says the offspring of the cattle is tied to the Lord. 
So everything that was increased was tithed. A tenth was go to go to the Lord. Now the reason for that was to take care of the priest and the Levitical priesthood. Now, take your Bible and turn to Numbers 18, look at verse 26, and see something else about it. Numbers chapter 18, verse 26. Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even what? A tenth part of the tithe. So what are they doing? They're tithing the tithe. How many of you ever heard a preacher say, well, pastors, since they're, they live off the tithe, don't have to tithe? Have you ever heard someone say that? I've heard that. Repeat it a lot of times. I've heard several idiots say that. Well, they'll jump on it, well, tithe is a law, but then they'll justify themselves, say, well, I don't have to tithe because I'm... Pre well, if tithe is a law, neither does your members, so what do you make a big deal out of it anyway? Amen? I mean, honestly, here's a Bible believer pastor, he says, well, I don't have to give because, I mean, I'm a pastor and I live of... It. I've heard them say that. I've heard them say that. And you're going to say, what's the problem there? Well, if you want your people to tithe, you're supposed to be an example unto them. So I don't buy it. I don't buy it from them. Take your Bible to Nehemiah. Look at it again. I don't buy that. Um, Nehemiah chapter 10. I think a preacher should tithe. Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes. And the Levites shall bring of the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God, to the chambers, into the treasure house. Now that's a tithe of the tithes, for money. And where does he do They give it to the Lord's house. Alright? So if this stuff in the Old Testament is written for our learning under law, I mean, if I'm going to put myself on the law, I'm required to tithe as a preacher. I, I can't just sit there and tell you you're supposed to tithe, I have to tithe. Matter of fact, I'm supposed to be... There is nothing that I should tell you to do that I'm not willing to lead you by doing myself. A lot of preachers should learn that. A lot of pastors should learn that. We're in samples to the sheep. Okay? Well, you, you all be examples one to another, but i got to be an example to you. Uh... No shepherd drives the sheep, he leads the sheep. A lot of preachers want to be cattle drivers instead of shepherds. I mean, that's, I've seen that time and time again. Alright, so that's under the Levitic, Levitical priesthood. That's under the law. That's the way the law was set up. And God took it serious enough under the law where if they did not do it, he considered them a thief or a robber. Take your Bible and turn to Malachi chapter 3. Now somebody that doesn't separate the law will put this on the Christian. Alright, Malachi chapter 3. Now... Give me just a second. Alright, Malachi chapter 3, and let's look at verse 9. Verse 9. Let's go back up to verse 8. Will a man rob God? That's a pretty risky business. Okay. Yet ye have robbed me, 
But you say, where and have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So did they rob him? Yes. yes. How did they rob him? By not giving him his tithes and offerings. That was due. Uh, if I do work, and you agree to amount, and you don't pay me, you rob me. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You took labor without paying. There's different ways people steal. People steal today all different types of ways. Okay? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now wherewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So they are given a promise if they would do the tithe, then God would bless them. Okay? So that blessing was def- uh, directly connected with if they would actually tithe. If they were to give to the Lord. That's under law. That's a promise. You say, can I put that on a Christian directly? No, I can't. That's under the law. We'll leave it where it belongs. It belongs under the law. Amen? So is a church age saint under the law? No. No. What is the law to us? An example. It's an example. It's an example. It's cool, man. So something that we should learn from. Let me ask you something. When did the law come? With Moses. With Moses. When was the first time the type shows up? Uh, with Melchizedek. With Abraham. Was Melchizedek a Levite? No. 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 Matter of fact, Melchizedek, as we said last week, is either a very good illustration and example of Jesus Christ, or he's Jesus Christ himself. The Word, before he was born of a virgin. In other words, Jesus Christ before He became a man. Alright, now we, we went into that was the whole Sunday school was about last week. Okay? So, who would Abraham be given to? Him? The better. He's given to the better. An example of our priest today that we're on. Who's your high priest? The Lord Jesus Christ. And Abraham gives him a tent before the law is even here. Right? So can you say that the doctrine of tithes is under the law only? Oh boy. (laughs) And that's... uh... Now wait a second. We're not dealing with something that's only... The law. Now that, that's just a reality check. It's not just law. Abraham wasn't under law. Neither was Jacob. Jacob tithes. Now let's, let's give you two verses with them. Well, we got the verses on Abraham here. Did he tithe or just promise to? Because I never saw where he tithed. He actually did it. Well, he makes the promise to do it. I assume that Jacob's a man of his word. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the intention and the knowledge was there whether he does it or not. <laughs> and the Lord does bless Jacob. I assume that Jacob did do it. I assume he did do it. Um, it, it doesn't follow through with that, but Now, Jacob isn't like uh, Abraham. Uh, Jacob actually wants the blessing before he dies. (laughs) That's what he says. Jacob's a willer and a dealer, and even with God, he wills and deals. Uh, I mean, that's just Jacob. Jacob's a little different. A lot of Christians are like Jacob. Take your Bible and turn to... Now, uh, let's look at Abraham under the law. Go to um, Genesis, 
Well, let's get Jacob. We've already looked at Abraham. Abraham's here in Genesis 14. We've looked at that in detail. And here it's talking about Abraham. So we know Abraham tithed. That's obvious. Let's look at the one with Jacob. Jake, uh, Genesis 28-22. Now let's look at Jacob. Genesis chapter 28, verse 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So that's what he says. He says he'll do it. Well, where did he get that from? Well, obviously his granddaddy Abraham it was passed down through the knowledge of Isaac. Obviously he had the knowledge that he was supposed to give the tenth. He has that knowledge. And uh, so the tithe is not just a law, it is a practical knowledge that we should have. That's biblical. Is it not just a practical knowledge? Are you under it? So what does that mean? You say, well, I don't give a tenth. Well, I'm not going to call you a God robber. You're not under the law. I will say this. You ought to read your Bible again. Okay? Is that fair enough to say? I don't want to give a tenth. All right, you're not a God robber. You're not under the law. But you should read your Bible again. And you should keep reading until you finally get it. Because it was written for your learning. And you don't want to learn from it. You want to ignore it. It's there. So you got it. Uh, you have the tithe under the law. You have it before the law. Abraham and Jacob. Where else do we have it? Take your Bible and turn to Nehemiah. I want to show you another interesting passage in Nehemiah. Now, in Nehemiah, it's a time of restitution for the children of Israel bringing them back into the land after the Babylonian um, captivity. So the Lord's bringing them back into the land and He's restoring them. Take your Bible and turn to Nehemiah chapter 11. Nehemiah chapter 11. Nehemiah chapter 11. And look at verse 1. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of what? Ten. Ten. To dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. And nine parts to dwell in other cities. What is that? That's a tenth of the children of Israel that's to be given to who? The Lord. So they're tithing of more than money, they're tithing of people. Back to God. What is that a picture of? Now I have a very, very scary a pen. Well, first of all, before I jump to that, I'll show you a it's a picture of take take your Bible and I'll show you another picture. The picture is the same thing. Go to first Samuel chapter eight. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and look at verse 15. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15. Now he's talking about the new king that they were going to have because they did they wanted a king over him and they did not want God over them. Under the judges, God was their king. Okay? The judges weren't their king. They were just the servants. 
God was their king, but they wanted a king like the other nations had. So here's the warning that's given to them about the king that will be set over them. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. A tenth of their seed, that's their children. So in other words, one tenth of their population is going to serve that king. So in Nehemiah chapter 11, the Lord has the tent go to Jerusalem. Now, what's so important about Jerusalem? The city of God. Dr. Ruckman teaches in an appendix that he has. If you have a Ruckman reference Bible, write this note down. Look at appendix 36. I want to read you what he says. I'm not 100% about this one. I think he is correct. That's why I'm reading it. I believe he's correct. But, uh, well, I didn't bring my Ruckman reference Bible. I meant to bring that. Do you have a, does anybody here have one? A Ruckman reference Bible? Do you have it on you right now? No. Does anybody have one on them right now? No. Okay, I'll have to tell you what it says though. What it says, and he gives you a bunch of verses, what he's te- saying, it, teaching it, and I didn't fully follow his thought, but I definitely see the picture, is that one-tenth of the Jews God will allow to go to the Antichrist and have their heads beheaded and be sacrificed in the tribulation. One-tenth of them will die that way. If he's correct, you know what you have before they're restored, to get them to be restored as a payment? A tithe of the people in the tribulation. Matter of fact, Hebrews is a picture of the Jews in the tribulation and the tithe is being emphasized here in Hebrews chapter 7. Will that be just Jews? Huh? Will that be just Jews or anybody? Well, I did a study where I think only one-tenth of the world will enter into the millennium. Which would mean only God only takes a tenth of the world. All right. Where I think that 90% of the world's population will be destroyed through the tribulation. Now, I, that study was a while ago. I can't give you the verses on that. That's something you should study for yourself. But that was my calculation on it. Yes, sir? So, sorry, this, this part that the king takes? Yes. So the tithe goes to the Lord. The one-tenth that the king takes is it's just what he's going to do. It says what he's going to do. He's going to take a tenth of their seed to be his servants, his soldiers, his his government. He'll take one tenth, which shows you that our government's a little bit greedy. But they take a little bit more than a tenth, amen. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but that's what he's going to do. All right. Uh, what, he's, what Dr. Rubman's saying is a picture that God allows this king that the world wanted and a punishment to the Jews because they reject him as their king and says, we want a king over us. The Antichrist says God given the world what they want because they reject him, so he gives them a tenth. He gives them the tenth. Huh? And so now we have to worry about tax evasion. Have, have, sorry, it was just something that came Yeah, you, you're, you lost me there, brother. <laughs> if, if they faulted on their tithe, then they were supposed to tithe double, which was a fifth instead of a tenth. It was the next verse, wherever you were in the citizen. If they faulted on their tithe? Yeah, if they tried to 
Well, God still held them accountable for it. Because basically they robbed God. I mean, if you go by that, you'd have to say that you have to give four times the amount. Because the punishment for Robin was restored fourfold. But now I, I'm not going there. I mean, I'm not going there. I mean, but I, I wouldn't go there. Uh, I, I, that, that one right there, I don't think I'd go there. But the tenth is what's required. So you'd have a tithe before the law, you'd have a tithe in the law, the tithe's mentioned after the law in the tribulation. Now this is where I'm going. So what do you have left? You got it everywhere but here. What, what does it say about us? Take your Bible and turn to uh, sec, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 6 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Kind of matches Malachi, doesn't it? And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, He doesn't give you an amount here. He doesn't tell you it has to be a tenth. But He still puts the same principle. He sent them back to If you tithe, I'll open the windows of heaven and you'll receive a blessing. Here, He's saying, if you do, if you give, I'm going to take in reward you for it. You are rewarded for your giving. The Lord looks at that as service from you. He's going to bless you for it. You say, well, if I give, does that mean He's going to give right back to me here? I'm not saying that. Now I will say this from my own experience. I've never been able to outgive God. I'll say that from my experience. I have never successfully outgave God. Say, so have you ever tried? I've pushed the limits a few times <laughs> to see, but I've never been successful at it. I've never been successful at it. And I doubt if you have your heart right and do. Now, if you're given to get because you're a lover of money and you think you can manipulate God, you're dealing with the wrong thing. Wrong individual. God knows the heart. And motivation behind giving, especially in the church age, is something that has to be under consideration. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought you was raising your hand. Um, so that has to be. Let's look at the motivation behind the time. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Can the motivation behind the tithe be wrong? Well, yeah, it can be wrong and it can be right. And motivation means something to God. Here we go in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have done, and not leave the other undone. Isn't he pointing on some motivation there? He's saying, you may give tithe, but it doesn't matter to me. You can't take and cover up these other sins with your tithe. That doesn't work. That tithe did not make you righteous. Now that's what he's saying here. Now Luke 11.42 gives you another detail. Look at Luke 
Luke chapter 11, look at verse 42. This is a companion verse of what we just read, just in a different gospel. It says, But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and what? And the love of God. These ought ye have done, and not to leave the other undone. I always said, God love a cheerful giver. You know why you should be given to God? Not the same reason you pay your taxes. I love my country. Well, then quit complaining about paying taxes. Amen. <laughs> I mean, amen? <laughs> I mean, if you truly love your country, you have no problem paying your taxes and supporting it. All right. All right. I'll, I'll quit meddling. <laughs> Back off there. You, know, you might not love your country quite as much as you think you do. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, all right, you love God? then tithing ain't a problem. I, I've never found it to be a problem when you love the Lord. God looks at the heart. Matter of fact, um, the way God's going to reward people is according to what's in their heart, not according to the amount that's given. Now take your Bible and now let's look at God's view of value when it comes to your giving. Since we're on tithe, and we're on motivation of tithe, let's look at God's view of value. Take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. I don't often preach and teach on giving, so we're going to go the whole nine yards today. Mark chapter 12, pick up verse 41. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there was a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites. Say, what's interesting on that? What's interesting is she threw in two mites, not one mite. So she didn't throw in 50%. She threw in 100% of what she had. Why? Because the two mites didn't mean a whole lot to her. The ideal that she could give to the Lord meant a lot to her. Two mites may have not bought much. For her. I don't know. I don't know the value of the two mites of what it could have got her, which make a farming. And he called unto him his disciples and said unto him, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast him more in than all they which have cast into the treasury, for all they did cast in their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. That's why I say it was a hundred percent. Why would she do that? wasn't required of her. That wasn't her tithe. Her tithe would have been one-tenth. She gave all her living. All in one. And her want wasn't very much. It was less in value than everything that had been put in before her. But when God looked at it, He says, alright, she gave of what she had and her want. She'll be rewarded according to the value of how much and the motivation of what she gave. I think at the judgment seat of Christ that we will find a lot of Christians who are very inadequate with very little talent and very little provision will be rewarded much greater than pastors over churches of 10,000s and 1,000 mega churches. Why? Because they gave of the Lord from the heart out of the abundance of what they had and they served them of what they had. Let me tell you, do you have a real high IQ and talent and great skills and stuff? 
You better be careful the way you judge somebody that has none, that you think is a doofball, yet loves the Lord and is trying to do whatever they can for them. The judgment seat of Christ, you might find that in the Lord's eyes, they were ten times the Christian that the talented person was. Have you ever thought about that way? I mean, I've met some Christians where people are walking around them, avoiding them because they, they got issues and stuff. Maybe they, they don't have quite the full mental capacity or something like that. And uh, they, they get kind of pushed to the side. Kind of, the, the Christians just put up with them, you know. I, oh my, I start talking to them individuals and they're talking about heaven, talking about the Lord, love to sing and love to take in just talking about the Lord, and I sit there and talk to him, and I look at him like, man, I wonder if this guy's got something more than what I got. I wonder if this guy's closer to the Lord than what I am. Don't despise him. Don't despise him. I mean, you don't know. I think God's judging value is going to be a little bit different than what we think at the judgment seat of Christ when it comes to Christians. Why? Because He knows the heart. So the motivation of giving has to be pure and right from the heart. You're not going to fool God. He searches the heart. If you're given to show how spiritual you are, which when you're not spiritual, which is what the Pharisees did, God could care less about your money. You think God needs your money? He doesn't need your money. That's one reason I have a hard time getting too worked up about preaching on giving. God has a cattle on a thousand hills and He doesn't need your money. What He wants is your heart. He wants your heart. And if you have the heart, well then you don't love the money. Amen? Can't serve two masters. You can't love the Lord and love money. You can use money, you can have money, you can earn money. I mean, money has a useful need, yes. I understand that. I may not love money, but the guy that has the groceries I want does, so I needed to give it to him, you know. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) So, So there's a certain amount where, yeah, money does control our actions while we live on this earth. I mean, there, there's a, I work a 40 day week job. Why? So I can have money to provide for my family and to get the stuff that I need to get. You know? But I don't love it. I don't love it. Love of money is the root of all evil. Some covet it, have erred from the faith. You can't love God and love man, then you can't serve God and serve mammon. God has to be the first foremost. If God's the first and foremost, the giving's not going to be a problem. I don't have to tell you or preach to you tithe. What I have to preach to you is love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Because if you love the Lord the way you want, should, your giving will not be a problem. You'll want to give to Him. You'll have the desire to give to Him. That will be in your heart. So it's not emphasized in the church. It's not emphasized here. You don't see tithing put on anybody in the church age. You see giving. You see the desire to give. You see that you're supposed to give and support, but He never puts the amount on it. You say, why is that? Well, Because if you have the heart that you should, I don't think I'd give it a number. Because I'm fixing to give you something. Here's your tithe in the church age. He wants you, Christian. He wants you. 
That's a hundred percent. He wants you. Say, preacher, go back to the tithe, will you? <laughs> let's let's get off. Let's get back on the tenth. You know, hundred <laughs> percent. Because if he has you, he has everything with you. Yes, sir. It's, it's the Lord's anyway. Everything that you have is focused on serving the Lord. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Your house is for serving the Lord. Your family's for serving the Lord. Your vehicles is the Lord. Your, your increase is the Lord's. Your money's the Lord's. Your job's your Lord's. Your business is the Lord's. Everything's the Lord's. It's yours, Lord. You can have it. And how many Christians are going to get there? That's, that's, you're right. Most of them will want the tenth to go back to the tithe. And that's going to be some of them. And then other ones, they've never even gotten there. They've never even gotten there. Yes, sir? Huh? Oh, what is he asking here? <laughs> you lost me there, brother. Oh, well, that's the devil's currency, anyways. That's just telling us the rapture is fixing to happen, brother. <laughs> I mean, that's. <laughs> yeah. How much does God require of the fake money that they're giving us? I mean, <laughs> a, a fake percentage of it, I guess. <laughs> I mean, they pretend you have money, so pretend you're giving to God, okay? I mean, there's, <laughs> it's fake money. <laughs> I haven't thought about that one yet. You mean when they go to virtual money, how in the world are you supposed to give to the church? Uh, that's why the church's money is in a bank. You can take your virtual money and put it in their virtual bank account. You know, that's a... Uh, I don't know, brother. I don't know. I do know that that is definitely the way the Antichrist is going to control buying and selling because it will be virtual by permission. Yes, sir. Huh? Oh, you're getting so set up for it right now. If you can't see it, you're blind as a bat. You're just as blind as a bat. And that virtual money thing is, boy, they're pushing that. That thing gets pushed more and more every day. You're seeing that pop up. But, but anyway, that's a. I thought I was going to have a little extra time to do something different, but we don't. So let's take a break there. And uh, we'll pick up services in a bit.